thanks for coming back to the CEO for Life Experience vlog and podcast. Um, I have Sarah Furness here with me today, and uh, I've had a chance to talk to her for a few minutes. But as you guys know, I find some really great people through LinkedIn, and I happen to stumble across Sarah, who is a 20-year-plus veteran in the Royal Air Force, and she's taken all of that knowledge to jump into trying to help people tackle the mind. And Sarah, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me along. It's a pleasure to be here. That's super cool. Well, listen, um, maybe you can kind of share with the audience just a little bit of your background, and then we can jump into some really cool topics and try to tackle a few today. Of course, yes. Yeah. So as you said, I spent 20 years in the Royal Air Force flying helicopters, um, which isn't necessarily the most uh, normal progression into mindfulness coaching, but that is where I found myself because I was just really, I had a fantastic time in the military and surrounded by exceptional people and, you know, very tough, bright people as well. And I was just very struck as I was learning more about human beings that um, sometimes we don't always feel as strong as we look. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of being tough and we don't necessarily want to deal with that by, you know, um, dealing with labels of being broken. I don't think people are broken. I just think that sometimes if we understand the brain a bit more, we can do more with it. So I was really struck by this. How can I help these strong, capable, tough people who aren't broken? And I realized that that remit went beyond the RAF and that I needed to set up my own company to be able to do it really. What a cool story. So a lot of what we talk about in the CEO for life is finding through self-awareness, finding your passion and your vision and your mission, but then acting on it. And what I love is, um, you know, how, how you took action in order to take on this thing that you're passionate about. So <clears throat> anyone that's listening today, you know, so let's start there. So if anyone listening today, um, how do you go about taking action on something that is wildly possibly different than a 20 year amazing career, right? You could have probably went on for a longer, but you decided to make this change. How did you go through that process of navigating that? Yes. Yeah, so it starts, I think for a lot of people, and certainly for me with your own personal journey and realizing that it's interesting because in the military, we sort of follow orders and it's, you know, it's important that we do that but also realizing that I needed to trust my instinct and, and learn to understand what my mind was telling me and learning to navigate when it's sort of leading you down a garden path and self-sabotaging, which the mind loves to do, but sort of finding my true north. So I think it was the personal journey and sort of coming through the other side, I suppose, that made me realize that I'm not the only one that would benefit from this. And I realized a very simple but life-changing thing was that we have a choice. We have a choice how we respond to whatever life throws at us. Um, and we have a choice how we respond to those thoughts and feelings that come up. And for the longest time, I didn't feel like I did. And then it was a sort of light bulb moment where I thought, actually, no, I do have a choice. And this, this amazing brain of mine, I don't have to be at the mercy of it. I can use it to work for me. So that was the sort of catalyst, if you like. Yeah, no, that's, that's a super way of looking at it. So let's dive into that a little bit deeper because you use the word choice and I've been really fascinated with this idea of choice lately. <clears throat> so as a CEO for your life, in that mindset, in your mindset, maybe you can give us a definition. Do you think there's a difference between a choice and a decision? How does, how does, that, how does that language resonate with you and is there a difference? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think language in itself is fascinating. Yeah, Every word that we choose, um, words are powerful. The brain listens to the words that we use. So I think the first thing is realizing you have a choice, which allows you to make a skillful decision, which serves your needs and values. So I suppose I would, it's almost a chicken and egg scenario where first of all you have to realize that you have the choice before you can make a decision and I think a lot of the decisions that we make without realizing it we sort of delegate it to the automatic functions of our brain or we delegate it to external influences and we think that we're making those choices but those choices have been made for us whether consciously or subconsciously COVID's a very good example because a lot of our choices have been taken away from us and we're aware of that but even down to simple things like, you know, who decided that a can of Coke would be 
330 mils and therefore that's how much <laughs> coke I might drink in a day that wasn't my choice but I think it's my choice so it's just sort of waking up to how many times we give away our choices and then once you realize how abundant that uh, that is and of course you've got to be pragmatic about it but once you realize just how much power you have then you can make choices um, and then you can make decisions so I, I feel as though that's the kind of journey that one goes on so anyone that's listening to this stop for a moment go back and rewind those last 15 to 20 seconds and if you're on one and a half times speed go back to one time speed listen to what she just said so so sarah just said that we give away choices you know and i just had this revelation in my mind right i mean it's it's you know one o'clock here locally time and I'm, i was just immediately thinking about my morning and how many choices i gave away today just by naturally going through whatever they were and then also through naturally wanting to avoid some things that i didn't want to deal with at that time and it just happened that way i wasn't consciously thinking about it that's huge the other thing you said was language influences the gray matter. Maybe you can expand on that a little bit more because I love that thought. And I think we need to be more mindful about that. What do you, what, what do you mean by that? So I am, um, yeah, fascinated by the words that we use. For example, one of my, not bugbears, but one phrase that I like to use to demonstrate this is when you say something like, he makes me angry or she makes me sad mm -hmm. so just there's a couple of things that you can dissect with that and again I know you know we can't sit around and dissect our words all of the time we have to sort of get on with life mm -hmm. but first of all are we angry or are we sad you know we're limited by the words we have to describe an experience and as soon as we mm -hmm. try to describe an experience then potentially we're distorting it I mean it's kind of like Schrodinger's cat <laughs> or yeah. you know quantum physics yeah. if you want yeah. to go down that that line of thinking so first of all, we potentially limit and distort our experience, but also he makes or she makes. So you've given that other person the power for you to have an emotion. Now, the reality is no one's in your head. Of course, people influence us. Of course, we have a response to other people's behaviors, but nobody can make you happy. Nobody can make you sad. So just in the language that we use, we give away our choices. We give away our power. And the brain is listening to all the words that we use and sort of going, oh, okay, well, that person makes me angry. So the next time you see that person, your brain's already decided the outcome, but you're not choosing the outcome. It's been made for you. So that's what I mean about language is that's understanding cool. how much power those words have and just being mindful about the words that you use. Makes total sense. I, I, I'm, I'm glad we went down this little branch for just a little bit because I think it's super critical and your expertise on that is awesome. So I'm gonna try to bring it back around real quick. So um, obviously as a pilot in the Royal Air Force, I mean, you know about survival. You probably you probably train more on survival, I don't know, than probably a lot of other things. Um, let's talk about it in the context of being a CEO for your life. Being a CEO for your life basically means that it's a job that's been given to you when you were born. You can't give it away, you can't delegate it. So you might as well get on with it, right? And so talk about, because especially within these times, a lot of us are feeling like we're just trying to survive and I'm not trying to minimize anyone's situation at all. I'm just saying that there are a lot of people that are trying to survive. So as a CEO for your life, what guidance do you give from your learning, your training, your experience being in combat, those kind of things? How do people begin to move past survival to be, you know, to be, you know, to what you are coaching people to be? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And I mean, it, the, the very short answer is it comes down to the same thing for me. It comes down to choice and realizing that you have a choice. And I think um, when I work with people, the first thing I do is help them to understand the survival part of the brain, which is the oldest part of the brain and very powerful. You know, if you've read the chimp paradox, it's known as the chimp brain. And I, I often speak about sort of my inner chimp. And ultimately it is doing a tremendously good job of keeping us alive and in the military you rely on that and you train and train and train so it's automatic so that you don't have to think consciously about what you're doing so not having to think very hard about what you're doing is excellent for survival but it's not great for happiness or fulfillment so we tend to do what we need to do to stay alive as opposed to following the path of you know what are my needs what are my values how do I want to look back on myself in those years to to come 
So I think, first of all, it's understanding how strong the survival instinct is and that there's nothing wrong with it. You're not a bad person <laughs> for having this. And we don't need to be hard on ourselves for this. But ultimately, you know, we were, when we sort of evolved into humans, we were given this wonderful rational cortex brain, which is responsible for creativity and logical thinking and all these things. And ultimately, what I do is I help people to use that part of the brain through mindfulness, which is mental training. So I think, first of all, again, it's showing people they have a choice and they can use their brain how they choose to. And they can, they can sort of nurture and calm their survival um, instinct. Because again, you probably know this, but the survival part of the brain works on a safe uh, safe rather than sorry. So it will overinflate the danger. And as you say, it's not to minimize what people are going through. It will feel terrifying potentially to a lot of people what's, what's happening to them. But the reality is that's our survival brain and it may well be over-egging the threat and making us pretty miserable yeah, in the yeah, meantime. Yeah. And you know, so nobody wins out of that. You stay alive, but it's you know, not much of an existence. So I think it's to understand that survival is great but understanding that you have some agency and you can ultimately go, okay, I've got that sort of bit of information, that bit of data, thank you very much. But also I can now employ rational thinking and decide what to do with all of that information. Yeah, this is a super personal discussion for me because, you know, I've dealt with anxiety from a, from a really, a really clinical time, three times, you know, I had to see someone to help me work through that anxiety process in my life. And and it is the, the amygdala that, that, you know, the lizard brain, whatever chimp brain, whatever we want to call it, it is super powerful in the way that it can over inflate the things. Again, it doesn't minimize the issue. I mean, bills need to be paid. You could lose your house. You could have health issues, family issues. I mean, any number of things. Um, so, so those things are, are really dramatic. And so, and you've experienced them, you know, from, a, uh, you know, just trying to survive and live from someone trying to hurt you. So how do people begin to break down the process of moving past the survival? It is something you have to train yourself. You, you talked about mindfulness. Walk us through, you know, just, you know, if we have a little bit of time with you, Sarah, you know, what could we start to do um, to learn from you about getting past that survival mode? Sure. Um, so what would be the most important thing to take away? First of all, understanding that you have a survival brain, and that's what's responsible for those strong emotions, fear, disgust anger they're all ways of keeping you alive so the first thing is that you can notice what your feelings are and notice that they are actually out to help you and there is a positive intent so just being aware of your feelings in a non-judgmental way because we often go oh i'm angry i'm anxious and i shouldn't be and that's you know understandable but not very helpful because your brain is going no no you have to pay attention to what i'm showing you right now or else you'll die so trying to bottle up your emotions is not going to help so understanding that these emotions are giving you data to keep you alive, recognizing those feelings. And then you can do a couple of things. You can recognize it and then your rational brain can say, but actually maybe it's not so bad. And an emotion is like anything else. If you give it energy, it gets more powerful. And if oh, you don't give it that. energy, yeah, I it love sort that. of diminishes of its own accord. So mindfulness allows you to focus your attention where you want it to be if you choose to focus on another task if you choose to focus on your breathing if you choose to focus on you know what you can see around you you cannot give energy to that emotion anymore and it will diminish it may come back and it will pull strongly for your attention but it will diminish and that's not the same by the way as avoidance that's about skillfully choosing. Oh, that's an incredible point. Attention. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's not running away. I love that. That's, oh yeah. Oh, let's walk about there. Yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So again, you know, I think that's a really important distinction is that when we're employing mindfulness, we are, we are choosing where to focus our attention, but we're acknowledging it. We're saying, I, I acknowledge this anger or this fear is trying to keep me safe, but ultimately I get to choose how much attention I give to these emotions. Sorry, one second. I'll be back in 10 minutes. I'm so sorry. Homeschooling. No, I love it. I mean, this is real. I mean, this is, I love it. Are you kidding me? It's awesome. So when we're trying, um, let me sorry, ask you yes. this. So, let me ask yeah. you this. Is it, 
is it easier to avoid or eventually is it going to make it worse? I mean, a lot of people get by very successfully by avoiding these That's things. what I'm wondering. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, you can just kick it down the street, right? And you could kick it down the street for a long time. Um, yeah, you so can. You and people on in that. I mean, I'm sure you get lots of clients that come through and they've probably been avoiding a lot of things. How do you help them get mindful and focus? And like you talked about feeding the energy into those things that are that are going to be helpful. How do you how do you go about doing that? So that's the other side of mindfulness, which is, I think it's a lesser known side of it, but I call it sort of distress tolerance. It doesn't sound like any fun. Um, so, so tell me a little bit more about what you mean by distress tolerance. Sure. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't sound like very much fun, does it? But the thing is, is that again, <laughs> our survival system is saying it's feeding this emotion of fear or um, anger because it's, stimulating your fight or flight and it doesn't want you to ignore that emotion because it doesn't know any better right so it will make it seem almost intolerable that emotion because it wants you to act on it so we think that when we're very angry just like oh i just i have to i have to you know snap at that person or when we're yeah. anxious you know I, I just i must worry and worry and worry because right. worrying gives us this illusion of control because we're yes. keeping yes. ourselves yes. alert so right. these emotions want us to stay kind of stuck because that sort of soothes our threat system in a, in a perverse way but the reality is is we can tolerate these emotions we can tolerate being sad we can tolerate a certain amount of anxiety we can tolerate being frustrated, um, we can tolerate being angry. So part of being mindfulness is just sitting with that feeling and saying, it's not going to kill me. And once you start to tolerate this distress, you now start to build this confidence that actually I don't have to act on every emotion, which is the opposite of avoiding it. So you're giving it an empathetic audience. You're saying, I hear what you have to say. I'm going to sit with you for a bit. And then I'm going to choose my next move skillfully using every part of my brain, not just the survival part of it. So, okay, so I'm going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate because I want to get your take on this. So, you know, Sarah, you just don't know how I feel. What do you say? What would I say to that? Yeah. Agreed. I don't know how you feel. And nobody can tell you how to feel. And I think it's an interesting point, and I've been through this, um, when it was incredibly important to me that other people understood how I feel. And it's almost like you don't have the confidence to be your own empathetic witness. Mm. But when you realize that the only person that needs to sort of hear you and listen to you is yourself, then you become much more self-reliant and you can just sit with an emotion. But I think we, as human beings, and certainly culturally, we're quite programmed to look out outwardly partly because you know we want help soothing ourselves, but partly because we're kind of looking for validation and going, I don't feel okay. Does anyone else feel like this? Am I the only one here? So we're kind of programmed to looking outwardly, but as you rightly say, no one knows how you feel. So that is your experience, but that means that you're, you're the one with the power to do something about it. You're the one who can choose how to respond. No one else can do that for you. So let's, let's, so, okay, you really got me thinking now. Um, and so let's take, let's take this a little bit further. So can you take it, can you take that thought process to the point where you become selfish and non-empathetic? I mean, everyone has a choice. That's the bummer of free will. So yes, <laughs> you could. So the reason but I bring it up is I just want to, you know, cause I do have friends and I do have clients, you know, that, that I can see that that they swing from one end of the spectrum to the other, right? Because, you know, it's like taking the wheel, right? And just jerking it and trying not to hit the deer, right? But then you end up in the ditch. So you didn't hit the deer, but now you're in the ditch, right? And so either one of them is good. So how do you, and I hate the word balance because there's never balance, right? So how do you move the needle in a way that it's, that it's healthy by using the mindfulness that you teach? How do you bring the needle maybe into the middle of, of those thoughts of not being totally in distress, but mm. then also not being totally selfish and cutting the whole world out and saying, you know, damn, damn it all. I don't care what anybody thinks. How do you get in the middle? 
Yeah, okay. Well, again, I mean, there's, so much, there's so much we can unpick here, but I'll try and summarize. Yeah. Ultimately, exploring your own mind. Yes, I don't know how you feel, but I do know what it is to be human and you know what it is to be human. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. suffering is a shared human condition. So the more you understand your own mind, the more you can start to empathize with other people. You know, my go-to emotion is anger. So I might look at someone who has a short fuse um, before I kind of understood what, what it was all about. I might go, you know, well, why are they like that? No one wants to be around that. But then you kind of realize that just like me, they're just trying their best. Yeah, <laughs> so actually, I think it's the opposite. I think it can really help with empathy and compassion. And I think when one doesn't feel empathy and compassion for others, it's usually because we don't feel much for ourselves and we're giving ourselves a very hard ride. So why should anyone else get it easy? So actually, I think it, it perversely works in completely the opposite way. It's a really interesting um, concept because I never thought about it like that. Is is you know if if you're if you're usually if you're angry at the world, you're also probably really angry at yourself. I never thought about that before. I never thought about you know that outwardly expression. You know, because normally when I run across someone that's always angry or confrontational, those kind of things. I'm always thinking about me, right? I'm not really thinking about what's going on inside of them, but that's really empathy to saying, what is that person going through? And I should really try to understand what that's happening. Man, that's a, okay, thanks for that hit in the jaw. I appreciate that, Sarah. So <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> um, so let's, let's keep moving down this line of, of thought, man, time is flying. Um, I want to continue to move down some things is, and I wrote, I've been writing notes as if we've been talking. Um, and the one thing I really want to focus on, so for, as a CEO for life, you have a vision, you have mission, you have goals, you're making lots of hard decisions, the world is giving you obstacles, you're having to say no to a lot of things. It can be, it can be very draining. Can we spend a little time learning from you about energy and how to pour energy into the right things in order to make ourselves better and being well? Can you walk us through some of that, your thought process? Yes, absolutely. So, and actually this has been I think that's the privilege of being a CEO for life is you literally get to choose what you do for a living, right? I mean, what could be more of a privilege? Terrifying, but, you know, really yeah. liberating. So I think the first thing that we can do and do well to do is to understand what our values are and what energizes us just to sort of throw that word straight back at you. And when I do that work with myself or with other people, I kind of start with, okay, where do you, where do you want to be in five years time? Describe it in as much detail as you possibly can. You describe what it looks like, you know, what house do you live in? Does it have a pool? Does it, you know, whatever. And, and then I start to say, okay, so if you have all that, what does that give you? And then normally they'll say, okay, well, it means, it means I can go on holiday four times a year, or it means I can do this, or it means I can do this. And you go, okay, what would that give you? Well, it would give me time with my family. Okay, what would that give you? Well, I want to be a good parent. And what would that give you? Well, you know, and, start, and then you start to whittle it down to things that you can't touch. Right. You know, well, I mean, obviously, you know, family, sure. but, you know, yeah. as in, they, you start to whittle it down to values. And then you start to realize that is what lights people up. Yeah. That's what they, that's what really energizes them. So I think once you understand what your values are, then and you can start to make every decision in accordance with those values, which is what mindfulness allows you to do because it gives you space to step back from those hot thoughts and feelings which are ultimately trying to protect you and say, okay, but how do I now make a skillful choice in accordance with my values, in accordance with the sort of person that I want to be and do things that energize me? So it's ultimately making those skillful choices. Does that answer your yeah. question or do you want to go no, back around? It does. That one? It's perfect. It's a perfect because, you know, I also do that with clients in a little bit different way, but I love the way that you described it is you whittle it down to the buckets of things that really matter to you. And then once you have that, you're then able to easily decide what to put your energy into. And I think that's a super clear way of doing it. Um, so anyone that's listening right now, and, you know, we just got a great schooling from Sarah, which is, you know, if you're struggling to figure out where to put your energy, go through that exercise of asking yourself all of those things and you're going to find those buckets and that's where you should put the energy, Sarah. So that's, that's, that's really an interesting way of looking at that. But that's a gift. Thank you for that. Um, so as we, as we kind of round out, cause we're getting into our time here. So there's a couple of other things that I wrote down that I wanted to make sure that we talked a little bit about was 
if you're in the mindset of survival, obviously you're not living your best life, right? How do you go about releasing yourself into the thing that you're meant to be? Because you're a perfect example of that. You had an incredible career in the military, right? I mean, you could have done anything and now you chose to do this. What Was there anything that, I guess what I'm asking is, was there a particular thing that released you into doing this or was it just a, something that happened over a period of time and you naturally fell into it? And then two, were there any people in your lives that were obstacles for you making the choice to do that? Because I think a lot of people run into that too. Uh, yes. And again, you know, fascinating questions. So I think this does tie into something I wanted to say earlier about the energy and the value as well. So it's, you can also learn just as much from unpleasant or undesirable experiences. And I don't say negative on purpose because actually these can be the greatest learning experiences. Yep. If you yep. recoil from something, that is your instinct saying, this doesn't sit right with me. That is a value indicator right there. So sometimes it's the difficult experiences, which if you're willing and feel brave enough and resource enough to look at them can tell you, actually, what is this telling me? That's what's important to me. And so you can start to uncover those values. So every emotion, every experience is an opportunity to get more data about yourself and about what lights you up. Right. And I think... You know, for me, for example, you know, I think it was a journey, but I think the straw that broke the camel's back, if you like, was when I was deployed to Afghanistan. Um, my son was two, and I always knew that would be part of the job would be deploying, so I didn't mind that. But they deployed his father at the same time, which they shouldn't have done, actually. So my son was effectively an orphan with both parents serving in a war zone. And that, for me, was too high a price for me right. to pay. I was never prepared to do that for that right. little boy that you see running around behind me. No, I, yeah, so, no, absolutely. And I was really, really angry. But the thing is, is that, you know, the military doesn't tuck you into bed at night. You know, you have to make your own way. And I realized that Sarah, no one, you know, no one's going to do this for you. If your son really is your true north, you've got to do something about that. So mm -hmm. that sort of, that anger, that really kind of fueled me to do something about it and go, right, put your money where your mouth is then. And, you know, go make a life where you can make him your true north so i think that was you know that's the kind of a turning point for me perhaps and in terms of sort of people standing in my way um i wouldn't I'm say so about I the think... people that cared about you because i think those are the things that we tr we struggle with the most is the people that love us the most also the ones that are 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 another source of maybe another amygdala right another like oh i don't want you to fail right so i mean yeah. did you have those people yeah. Um, actually, I don't know if my dad will ever listen to this, but he said, you will not make any money by the time you leave the Air Force. And I'm going to bet you this. And when I win this bet, I'm going to get you to take me for dinner and you're going to pay for it, Sarah. And I'm going to order the most expensive bottle of wine on the list just to point out how much you haven't made it. He didn't quite say it like that. But to be honest, so because his idea, you know, he was a self-made man as well. And out of necessity, because he actually was too um, ill to work a sort of normal nine to five job. And so I think he wanted me to know, like, yes, you've got these grand ideas, Sarah, but don't expect to just walk into making enough money to pay the bills and put a roof over your head. So he was trying to protect me. And, and there's been a lot of advice out there. You, know, you won't make any money. You won't make it. You'll fail more than you succeed and all the rest of it. But actually, I just find that energizing. Maybe it's because I'm stubborn. But I think, OK. That's fine, but I'm going to hopefully prove you wrong. But also, something I have really discovered since I started my own business was that I'm not afraid of failure anymore because every failure is another experiment and it was another sign that I was brave enough to try something. So I actually feel quite energized um, now in the face of, yeah, let's give that a go. You know, <laughs> what, what's the worst that can happen? Because it's right. not normally as bad as you think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I knew this episode was going to blow up. I knew it was going to be great. I mean, we talked about moving past survival. We talked about, um, you know, we're meant for more. We talked about self-awareness, about flipping the flaws with the things that we think, self-sabotage, choices versus decisions. We talked about where to put our energy, distress tolerance, where we choose to focus. I mean, this was awesome. This was so good. Um, anyone that's listening, um, Please, I want everyone to know, as I say in every episode, that the guests that we have on are real people. I was able to get in touch with Sarah by sending a direct message and following up and, you know, 
just communicating, you know, what I was trying to communicate. So I'm going to link information either above or below on how to get in touch with Sarah. She's a giving person, as you can tell. So please take this episode further. If any of this resonates with you, reach out for her. I'm sure she'd be more than happy. I'm going to take a step for you, Sarah. I'm sure she, I'm sure you'd be happy to talk to anybody, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, this was a super episode. Again, Sarah, I really appreciate the time. We're just about at our time that we try to keep these. There's so much here. I really appreciate it. If you're listening, please go back and listen to this one again. It was so good. And, um, and again, reach out for Sarah. But uh, Sarah, thanks for spending the time with us. Thank you. And, and thank you for dealing with the intrusions as well. No, sure. I love it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, you know, and as we talked about before, and I'm going to leave this part in the episode, is this is real life. We're real people. This is, it's okay. This is good. This is really good. We're all in this together. So, Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. Hey, everybody, listen, thanks for tuning back into the CEO for Life Experience uh, podcast and vlog. Uh, we keep bring, trying to bring you quality guests, unpacking what it is to be the CEO for your life. And uh, please drop some comments. Let us know. Get in contact with us, but definitely get in contact with our guests. They're super great people. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks.